Good day, uh, everybody, and uh, from uh, wherever in the world that you are logging into this webinar, uh, welcome and uh, have a good day. Uh, we're going to spend um, uh, some time here in this uh, um, uh, beauty uh, packaging webinar exactly on those two topics. Uh, there's a topic on um, uh, beauty, of course, uh, and there's a topic uh, on uh, the packing uh, industry. And um, we're going to have a look uh, at how we will be together, um, be in a better position to achieve compliance uh, through uh, digital maturity. Now, this may sound uh, a little bit um, um, uh, confusing to, at this point in time, maybe, maybe not, but it will become totally clear at the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, we have um, a, a range of expert uh, speakers uh, invited for this particular webinar, and um, I'll be quickly introducing them uh, for you here at this moment in time. Uh, we have uh, Dashit Gandhi from uh, McKinsey Company, uh, expert uh, speaker who will be sharing a couple of uh, ideas and insights with us on the uh, state of the packaging industry, looking at what are the main uh, mega trends. So welcome, uh, Dashit. It's good to have you here. Uh, we also have uh, Jacqueline uh, Bellomo from uh, Registrar Corporation. Uh, she will definitely introduce herself and with a little bit more detail, but she will be taking care of the beauty part of this uh, webinar. More specifically, we're going to dive into the uh, FDA update of the, uh, the MOCRA, so-called uh, MOCRA uh, legislation. Um, good to have you uh, here uh, as well, Jacqueline. And Tony, uh, my colleague, will be closing off the webinar with a bit of information about how ESCO Solutions will help you uh, stay at par with what's going on in the uh, industry. Um, my name is uh, Jan Deruk. I am Marketing Director here at ESCO, and it is my distinct pleasure to be your moderator for this webinar. Now, talking about uh, moderating this, let me um, uh, put forward uh, one, uh, one specific thing here. That is that after each of the sections, after Dashit's uh, section and after Jacqueline's uh, section, um, I will be having a bit of a conversation with the two speakers. So I'd be very, very happy to receive your uh, questions to drive that conversation forward. To uh, share your questions with me, please feel free to use the questions, the Q&A tab, uh, which you will find on your screen. Type in your questions and we will deal with them right after the individual uh, uh, presentations. Now, all this uh, being said, let me um, spend a moment to uh, to introduce uh, ESCO uh, to uh, to you. Uh, ESCO is the uh, the host of this uh, of this webinar. Essentially, ESCO uh, we are a, a technology uh, innovator that is playing in the entire vertical of the uh, packaging value chain. Uh, we make that uh, claim that if you would be walking through a supermarket or to any retail uh, space, you would find that nine out of 10 of the uh, packages on the shop shelves have been touched by an ESCO customer. And we're, we're basically touching that entire uh, very wide uh, range of uh, the whole uh, packaging industry, all the way from uh, ideation and the creative process on the side of the brands, driving the artwork management process all the way into the actual print production of uh, packaging, all the way up to the, uh, the retail uh, space. That's our, uh, that's our playground. And within that space, we have the ambition to provide uh, any of the stakeholders in that value chain with the most efficient technology, the most innovative solutions, uh, the most integrated uh, platform for you to do a good job at what it is that you need to do. We are absolutely convinced that uh, the, the industry is to today uh, uh, under a lot of pressure in, in terms of um, delivery times, uh, quality, uh, efficiency and, and cost reduction. And uh, this is exactly uh, our aim to help you with those uh, challenges uh, in, in, in the industry uh, today. We um, don't do this uh, totally on our own. We are part of a, a bigger group, group, uh, group called uh, Veralto, where we are in the very good uh, company of our uh, sister companies, Pantone, uh, leader, uh, world leader in color communication. X-Ride, world leader in color measurement instrumentation, uh, VideoJet and Lynx, uh, both uh, industry leaders in coding and marking on the filling lines. Now, very recently, you may have picked up that news in the uh, in the trade press, but um, uh, only last week, uh, Veralto announced the acquisition of uh, another uh, business called Trace Gains. 
Trace Gaines are a, a, a player in uh, ingredient uh, management and all the product development and compliance uh, management uh, solutions around that. Um, supplier documentation, managing uh, all that uh, is part is basically their uh, their key. So it, it basically fits nicely into this whole idea of um, uh, together with our sister companies providing for a ingredient to shop shelf type of uh, of solution. Now um, um, to close off uh, the uh, the introduction on uh, on the company side, um, we are not um, completely new into this industry. Uh, by now, after all these years that we're active in the industry, uh, fair to say that 14 out of the top 20 life sciences uh, businesses in the world are working with our solutions to manage their artwork. Eight out of the top 10 global retail players is doing exactly that as well, and 19 out of the top 20. Uh, CPG uh, companies, food and beverage companies, are using ESCO solutions to manage their go-to-market uh, process in uh, the most uh, the most efficient ways. What I would like to um, uh, provide you already here, and, and we can talk about that later on as well, uh, is a bit of a uh, is a bit of a framework that we have uh, developed in order for our customers to assess themselves as to where they are in their digital transformation journey. We've developed a maturity model for um, any business out there, basically. You don't necessarily have to be an ESCO customer, obviously, but any, any stakeholder, any business in the whole packaging value chain can use this model to assess themselves as to where are you today on your journey? Because, I mean, I'm sure you will agree with me that the only way to identify what is for you the most important next step in your digital transformation journey, it is absolutely necessary to know and to understand exactly where you are today. So we've built that maturity model, uh, which is not only looking at the uh, workflow, is not only looking at the tech stack in your business, it is also looking at how you are organized. It's looking at a couple of organizational dimensions, uh, as well as the uh, DNA and the, the culture of the, uh, of the company itself in order to determine where you are on this five-step uh, uh, maturity uh, uh, model of digital transformation. And with our solutions, with our technology, we very closely link this to the uh, speed to market uh, or so-called operational uh, efficiency gains that you will achieve in stepping up in that uh, journey of digital transformation. Whereas uh, today, we still see that a lot of um, um, a lot of businesses spend on average uh, around about 150 to 180 days in bringing a, a product to market with the different steps in digital maturity. We believe we can shorten that time to market down to five to, uh, to 10 days. And if that is something that you would like to dive deeper into, my colleague Tony will uh, come back to that topic uh, later on and uh, would be happy to, uh, to tell you a little bit more, not only about the maturity model itself, but also about obviously the solutions that are sitting behind this, um, um, this, uh, this model and uh, the whole idea to speed up your uh, time to market. But before we go there, let's dive into some of the more um, content matter in this webinar over here. And it's my uh, distinct pleasure, uh, Darshit, uh, to introduce you here, to basically give you uh, the floor, because uh, not only myself, but I'm sure also our attendees are absolutely anxious to hear from you what McKinsey is seeing in the marketplace as main trends. Darshit, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, and uh, hi everyone. Uh, just a brief introduction. So, Dashit Gandhi, I'm an associate partner with McKinsey, based out of uh, based out of New York. I uh, I do most of my work in the in the packaging space, so serving both some uh, serving both packaging buyers on on advising them on on packaging procurement design sort of stuff, as well as uh, working with a lot of packaging converters uh, in, uh, to help them mostly on the strategy and, and commercial slash growth side, right? So today, what we wanted to share with you is at least a few of a, a couple of uh, a couple of insights in terms of how how consumers are perceiving packaging and what are the key trends when the, that we are seeing in the market when it comes to uh, com comes to packaging, right? 
so with uh, with that let's just jump into it right so essentially uh, there are five key trends that we expect to drive the evolution of the packaging space in the next five in the next five years or so and when i say packaging it's broader packaging but i think most of them are applicable to cosmetics as well right which is what we are here to discuss right i think the first one I, it's not going to be a bit a uh, big surprise is around uh, is around sustainability right so there are sustainability requirements increasing at every step of the value chain be it from the be it from the brands but all and ultimately to the consumers right the, uh, the the second one is around the changing preferences of of, of consumers uh, we'll we'll get into the details of that and then uh, and third um, third one being the premiumization and the advent of e-commerce which has big implications on the on the packaging side of things um and then lastly uh, obviously there is the economic down uh, there is some nervousness around the overall economy which is which obviously we are uh, most of uh, also plays out in terms of cost pressures or margin depression that we expect to continue at least over the next few years and then lastly there is uh, with with new technologies ai uh, ai in iot on stuff like RF, rfids on packaging and stuff like that there there that could be an important driver especially on stuff like traceability uh, tra traceability of products and uh, etc et right what we'll do today is dive deeper into the into the first three right and then happy to get into the others uh, in the q and a as well right uh, so just starting off with the sustainability one uh, so mckinsey does a, uh, a, a we do a um, a consumer sentiment survey which is which is very which is focused only on packaging right and we we do it every every two years or so so we did uh, we did one in 21 and then we did one uh, sorry in 20 we did one in 2020 then 22 then 24 so we, we we keep doing this this survey just to give you a sense is around with around like 12000 12000 consumers which is across 11 countries etc right so we try to focus that and at what we've started to see is we've started to notice some changes between uh, between the years in terms of preferences shifting for consumers, right? So, uh, and, and let me highlight a few for you, right? So I think the first one is uh, is around, uh, is the fact that quality, convenience, and environmental impact has, has become much more important uh, in 2024 versus 2020, right? Not to say that it wasn't no, wasn't important in 2020, but it has just increased in importance, right? However, what has gone down is appearance, right? And when we say appearance, we are talking about uh, we are talking about like the appearance of the final product. So obviously, packaging plays a, a a very important role, and it and it at least what we found is that consumers are are uh, are, are less sensitive to the appearance or don't place uh, off the product itself. Right. And then the third thing that 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 I think might be relevant for us as well is like consumers view brand owners, right? Uh, brand owners along with the packaging producers as the as the people who are responsible for for sustainability, right? Uh, which is uh, and so that uh, that places the onus on these folks to 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 a deliver on the sustainability uh, uh, promise promises that have been made to the consumers right and and just to give you a sense we won't go too deep into each of these but like just to give you a sense uh, across countries we see a very very consistent trend in terms of who the consumers are are viewing as responsible for for packaging uh, for sustainability right and it's it's predominantly the producers as well as the the brand owners which are the which is the whites and the and the blues which are just about right so majority across countries right there are a few other stakeholders like regulators and retailers etc but i would say predominantly it's these moving ahead right and then when it comes to sustainable uh, sustainable packaging right there is uh, the uh, we, we we did a separate uh, i mean as part of it we also realized uh, that consumers are willing to pay more for some of the for sustainable packaging right and here the way we framed it is that uh, if a product comes with uh, with sustainable packaging versus say non sustainable packaging 
right? And again, the definition of sustainable packaging, uh, I would say, is not very clear, right? And so, uh, it's I would view it as as packaging that is viewed by customers as sustainable, right? So in some cases, uh, in many cases, paper is considered more sustainable than plastics, for example, right? And so. Uh, how much are you willing to pay more, right? Uh, I, uh, as you can see, there are there is enough evidence to say that consumers are willing to pay a bit more for consumer uh, for packaging, right? Uh, uh, sorry for the formatting glitch, but the middle middle bar is the uh, uh, sorry the second bar is the one which is for uh, for for beauty products, which is where which is which is what I think would be most applicable for you. But for this also, as you can see, almost more than ninety percent of of customers are willing to pay. So, but this is what they have said, right? And it's it's very good for for anyone to come in a survey and say that I will I will pay more. But let's see if they do pay more or not. Right. So, what we did is we did an analysis uh, with Nielsen data to understand how has the growth of uh, products with uh, with ESG claims, right, and for uh, uh, ESG claims being compared to those without, right. And we took a, we took the last four years or so in terms of time period, and we tried to compare this. And as you can see, there is there is a gap between products that have. Uh, uh, between the growth of products that have ESG claims versus without, right? And it's not an, uh, it's a significant gap, right? Uh, uh, and then on the right-hand side, what we tried to do is, is try to get a bit more specific in terms of what sort of claims that you have, right? And as, and and, and I think the, the point here is that, hey, the more specific you can get about the claims, Right, the more uh, uh, the more premium you are likely to get, or the more growth you are you are likely to drive. Right, and as you can see, the sustainable packaging claim also is is what we categorize as medium specific, but that results in that has resulted in the past of roughly four to five percent sort of uh, uh, faster growth in terms of uh, uh, faster growth in the market. Right, so this is something that uh, while the consumers say they are willing to pay, but it looks like on this evidence that they are also actually paying for it, right? Again, uh, uh, there might be differences in individual products and stuff like that, but across products, this is this is what we see, right? Uh, moving on, when we talk about consumer preferences, right, there's there's a few things and I'm sure uh, I'm sure some of this would would resonate with most of you, right? It's like there's always there, there is a demand of a lot more variety and more importantly, personalization, right for for uh, for customers, especially when it comes to packaging, right? So for example, the Coke bottles that have names on it, etc. Et Right, we've seen a lot of startups also uh, also leverage this trend to provide personalized uh, personalized packaging that actually drives uh, that uh, that that consumers value. Right, uh, we've also seen a bit of uh, I would say a shift towards more local products or locally sourced products uh, that that are gaining that are gaining traction in the market. Right, which has which has. Uh, which I would say has 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 driven a shift in terms of product design, but also in terms of of the player of the market mix, right? With a lot of small players also try starting to come in, right? Um, health and wellness is 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 another one, especially for cosmetics, looking towards natural ingredients, organic ingredients, bio products, etc. That would be, that's that the, those would be the uh, that that something that we are that we are seeing grow faster than the rest. Uh, consumers want to spend less time, so they are always focused on convenience, and at the same time, they are very very. Uh, uh, there is an increase in price awareness, which we see in terms of like private label growth uh, and stuff like that right so there's enough uh, there's a lot of changes in terms of consumer preferences and just to highlight how does that impact the packaging space right so there's there's a, there's a few things right so as uh, as the as the demand goes towards more convenience and more personalization there is a uh, an unboxing experience especially in the e-commerce uh, as given the rise of e-commerce right the unboxing experience becomes very very important right and obviously some of it was driven a lot more by let's say the the apple uh, or the iphone iphone boxes but 
that's being, I would let me say, try, uh, replicated or tried to replicate across many industries, which we keep saying, right? Um, labeling, labels have become uh, very important, right? And like premiumization in terms of labels, because labels is obviously a way to communicate the brand and that, that, that we've seen a big, big shift in in the demand for premium labels and, and 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 alternative decorations and then mask personalization that we talked about right what are the implications in terms of in terms of packaging or for the packaging industry right there's a lot of demand for like ultra short runs right uh, in terms of uh, more sku smaller order sizes resulting in smaller runs in manufacturing which many of the traditional players uh, or the assets of traditional players might not be equipped for, but that's a big shift that needs to be done. Uh, there's a need to get faster to the market, and this this comes from obviously some of the customers looking to get new products out faster, and then packaging also has to follow suit. Be it in terms of how fast you turn around designs and and how fast you like uh, get into the commercialization of the of, of of even the packaging, right? And then lastly, a lot of startups have come up in this space. Right uh, in in packaging, mostly looking at for, to facilitate customization or short runs and stuff like that. Obviously, with all the startups, there is always a question of how how big and how fast they will grow. But uh, but we've seen a big proliferation in that space as well. Right. Uh, so having said, uh, uh, having gone through the the key trends, right, uh, the key questions that we would want. Uh, want industry participants to consider right which is how do we how do we think about accelerating time to market be it from a buyer perspective uh, in terms of uh, buyer perspective which is uh, which could be uh, how do we get our product uh, out in the market and from a packaging uh, converter perspective that uh, on how do we support our customers to get that right how do we make it a point of differentiation the second thing is when it comes to e-commerce, how do we actually help deliver a, a, a premium e-commerce experience, right? So the unboxing experience, how can we tweak our products or do what capabilities do we need uh, in, or, in order to do that? For example, ship, ship ready packaging, right? Which Amazon has pioneered or something. That's something that, uh, how, do we, how do we support that? At the same time, how do we increase our competitiveness? Like TCO is total cost of ownership. So how do we how do we make ensure that we are uh, we are competitive on that? Uh, lastly, how do we make it stick? I've seen enough uh, packaging companies that can do when it when it turns to when it turns out to be an emergency, they can move mountains. But how do we do that on a ongoing basis? And then lastly, sustainability. Right? How do we win in that? Be it be it navigating regulations, uh, which, which we are going to talk about a bit more, but also in terms of uh, consumer preferences while balancing for, for cost, uh, by balancing for cost, right? So those would be the questions that I, uh, that I think most companies should consider or are considering. Uh, obviously, we have a lot more research on this topic. Uh, there's some links, I'm guessing you will have the presentation, so feel free to reach out. But let me pause there, and then, yeah, and you mentioned there could be some q and I'll uh, be happy to have a discussion. Yeah, I'm sure, uh, Dashit. Very uh, interesting uh, content you're uh, you're sharing here, and I I must say, even as a consumer, I do recognize my myself in some of the observations that uh, that you're sharing here uh, with us. Um, before I ask you my first question, I'd like to um, in, uh, reissue my invitation to all of the attendees to, if you have any, uh, drop your questions in the Q&A uh, box uh, here. Uh, there's already um, a couple of questions uh, in there, so uh, I would like to take the, the, the first one here, which is um, the whole e-commerce uh, discussion. Uh, what do you see in terms of um, uh, requirements there for packaging, uh, if anything specific for for cosmetic uh, products? How how is it impacting the uh, the industry in in cosmetics? Yeah, so I would say uh, I think two two uh, two big trends, right? And I uh, and to a certain extent they do conflict with each other, right? So one is obviously. Uh, uh, with uh, within cosmetics, there is the unboxing experience or delivering a premium experience. Given you will, uh, given the the customer will not be able to try the product in the store, uh, etc. So how do we ensure 
a package, uh, uh, how do we deliver a premium experience to the customer when he or she gets the product at home? But along with that, if the, if the customer wants to return it, how do we make sure that we minimize damage? And, uh, and so the packaging design, so the customer is able to open it with the premium and then also close it as we uh, close it, quote unquote, close it and make it ship ready. That, I think that's, that's one. I think the second one is when we talk about e uh, and when we talk about packaging in general, the way brands view packaging is obviously uh, view the cost of packaging is 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 through the raw material, mostly the cost of the raw materials and what it takes, right? And obviously we have light weighting and etc. Some of those things that we use to do this. When we when it comes to e-commerce, I think the cost of shipping the package also becomes important. Right and and hence the weight of the package becomes becomes more important than in the traditional sense because you are paying for it to ship, uh, and so that's where uh, that that's the other thing. So the question then becomes how do we uh, how do we balance delivering a premium experience while balance while being a lot more focused on costs right because the cost of shipping gets added directly proportional to weight so that's the challenge that most companies are are, are trying to navigate around yep. interesting thank you for sharing uh, sharing that you you've emphasized a couple of times the importance of the consumer um, experience um, in, in one of your slides related to that you uh, you mentioned that uh, some of these shifts that you see in consumer sentiment are, uh, on the one hand side, you see quality and, and convenience, uh, as well as sustainability uh, uh, growing in importance. Uh, but, and on the other hand, you, you mentioned that appearance uh, becomes less uh, important. Could you maybe explain that still a little bit more? Because I, I think um, uh, that there's a, there may be a little bit of contradiction uh, in there as well. Uh, appearance no, being also the, the print quality, uh, I guess, or the, the quality of the content on the pack. How how can that coexist, these two uh, trends? Yeah, no, so absolutely, right? And that's that's what we've seen is like, that's been the impact, I would say, of some, of COVID as well, right, to a certain extent, because when, when COVID happened and, and we had supply chain challenges post that, um, uh, and demands spike at the same time for for some of these products what hap what we realized happened is that some of the so called good enough products or not so good products not so premium products uh, which we at least in some of the developed markets like the us for example where we expected that the customers to go for premium products only right uh, but they showed a lot more uh, when pushed to it when there was no supply and so there was a lot more imports from say asian countries which were con quote unquote considered as not so premium but when they when it was available in the shelves we did not see cus customers walk away we actually saw a lot of uh, customers actually adopt it right and then what we've seen is that post that once it has stabilized some of that has stayed on right so we've seen a big difference in terms of consumers uh, getting further bifurcated in terms of some consumers. There were always consumers that were value consumers, but like the perception of uh, the perception of good enough quality has shifted a little bit, right? And so that's that's where we see that uh, there is a class of customers that that are that are okay buying private label for even for some of the cosmetic products. and and, and so we see growth there, right? Versus, however, there exists another, uh, the other category that's looking for a lot more mm -hmm. premium, natural ingredients and stuff like that. But that sort of bifurcation that I think has been driven because of what we saw post-COVID. Okay. Okay. Um... Thank you, uh, Dashit. In the interest of time, I just, there's one more question I'd like to uh, ask yeah. you, and then we'll need to uh, move uh, forward here. And uh, uh, thanks to the uh, participants for all the questions that you're uh, sharing with us here. But th there's one that I would like to pick out here, and that is the uh, the one about, um, um, you know, as, as brands, you, you need to juggle many of these different, um, uh, let's say, requirements. You have you have you have to keep an eye on your costs you have to increase your speed to market to respond faster there is now sustainability popping up as well 
um, this is almost an, uh, impossible to attain and, and reach all of these requirements. Uh, how, how do you balance uh, all of these requirements? Which one would you suggest a brand should pick now as the most priority one? Yeah, so that that's that's the million dollar question, right? Uh, at least what we've seen yeah. is uh, is that all of it are uh, it's not like all three are in conflict, right? So it's not like you have to balance you have to deliver on cost at the expense of sustainability or customer experience or or if you want to optimize for customer experience you have to do the others right so i think what we we, we call this the triple uh, the triple uh, the triple approach or uh, where at least from a packaging design perspective there we have seen uh, companies across industries right uh, use that approach to actually uh, drive uh, drive uh, positive change in all three metrics, right, or, or in all three dimensions. So, uh, and and so we increasingly that does require a big shift in terms of how do you think about design of packaging and and, and an end to end view in terms of what raw material are you sourcing till the end of how are you communicating your brand through it. But there are it's not really a a trade off that you have to do. There is enough evidence to say that you can optimize for all three. Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool. Excellent. Uh, Darshid, stay with me here for uh, for a moment because I would like to, um, instead of asking you a question, I would like to ask our audience uh, a question. So we will be doing a bit of a poll here to see how our audience feels about those five uh, mega trends that you put uh, forward. So out of these five trends for, for people in the audience, uh, which ones are the main priorities that will impact uh, your organization? And uh, uh, we have here uh, the ability for you to uh, share your voice with us, to share your uh, opinion with us here. Is the most important one for your organization? Is that uh, sustainability? Is that uh, changing consumer preferences? Uh, premiumization and e-commerce? Uh, economic downturn? Is that going to be um, um, your biggest concern for uh, in the future? Or is it the adoption of new technologies? Feel free to... Um, think for a, a moment not not, not too long because we're we don't have endless time here um uh, and and we'll then have a look at your um your answers uh, to see what comes out as uh, as the main uh, trend here we only uh, covered uh, dashit in, in this conversation the the, the three first ones uh, but i'm sure that also the economic downturn more importantly the uh, for instance inflation that we're all experiencing as consumers has an impact on how we buy and what we buy um, um, maybe um, if you can really make a real quick statement uh, about that one while people are thinking about their answers. Are you talking about the economic downturn one? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. So I think, uh, I think obviously with demand slowing down, uh, at least at least in the developed countries, uh, we do expect shifts in consumers. And I think I saw a question in the chat as well, right? In terms of how would how would consumers uh, 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 respond to economic downturn? I think uh, uh, increasing preferences for private labels across product categories, right? Uh, yeah. Increasing preference for private labels, postponing. Uh, postponing some premium buys, right? Uh, which which would be applicable for for uh, for uh, for cosmetics as well, uh, and down trading as I don't know what's the exact term, but down trading in terms of the brands that you buy, that's something that sure. that that yeah. we would definitely expect to happen over the next uh, as the economy as the economy recovers. Yeah, we, we definitely see these things uh, happening. Indeed, uh, people buy less, buy differently, and buy from different uh, vendors. Indeed, let's have a look at uh, how our audience has responded to the uh, to the poll here. And looks like uh, sustainability runs away with um, uh, being the number one uh, priority that uh, risks to impact uh, the, your organization. Uh, closely followed by all those uh, changes in consumer behavior and consumer preferences. That's um, is that is that kind of what you were expecting um, yourself also, Dashit? Uh, at least it tells me I chose the right three. But yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, um, yeah, 
I, I would say the consumer preferences uh, uh, might, might also be a bit more, uh, I would have expected it to see a bit more, a bit higher just because it's cosmetics and it's a much more consumer facing industry. But yes, I think the sustainability requirement one, I would expect to be high A because yes, so, that's the big buzz out there, but B because there's so much confusion around it because like what are sustainability requirements changes from not only from country to country, but I would say even from, let's take a US example from county to county or state to state. Uh, so that becomes, uh, and so that's something that I have seen many, like uh, many companies struggle with, right? In the end, like, because for example, if you go, even in the US, if you go like there's there's a big difference in the requirements for New York versus Chicago, for example, right? Or even New York versus New Jersey. And so that's where, uh, and like, that's just literally across the water. And uh, uh, yeah. but there are big requirements in terms of in terms of regulations, uh, which is something that I think many organizations struggle with. Yeah, we can uh, definitely spend uh, another full uh, full webinar on uh, just discussing this topic alone. But uh, let's leave it here uh, for now, uh, Dashit. Thank you very much for sharing all that information um, with us. And uh, let's move on uh, in our uh, webinar here to um, to our next uh, uh, speaker. And uh, Jacqueline, if you wouldn't mind uh, coming on to the stage, there you are. Um, I, I give you the floor right away. Um, if you could uh, introduce quickly um, who you are and um, what you, the company you work for, and then we can dive in the, in the topic of the FDA MOCRA uh, update. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Jacqueline Belomo, Senior Director of Cosmetic Science and Regulatory Affairs at Registrar Corp. Uh, Registrar Corp is one of the largest FDA compliance companies out there. We help with all types of products, uh, drugs, medical devices, food, but now with cosmetics, it's going to be our number one focus to help uh, responsible persons, facilities, companies just understand these new MOCRA updates. And we have a ton of services and support um, to help everyone understand what these new regulations are going to mean, especially when it comes to labeling. <clears throat> so I'm going to jump right in. Um, you know, I always like to start with the basics because <laughs> it's been a long time since we've had any update on cosmetics from FDA. Uh, MOCRA was the first uh, regu regulatory change in over 84 years. When you think 84 years, you're thinking that is a little bit crazy since other countries update every other month. Uh, so it's always good to kind of go to the basics and understand cosmetic packaging, uh, cosmetic labeling um, from the FDA standpoint. So the packaging does include the container or wrapper that the cosmetic product is displayed or delivered. The label refers to any printed or graphic material in the package, um, immediate container or affixed to the outer package. So really understanding you know the amazing presentation we just saw about sustainability and what that means uh for packaging and for labeling um fda is very much uh, in tune with the reduced packaging act uh, uh reduced uh paper packaging act so all of these things are really going to come into play to understand uh where regulatory sits as we're trying to be more sustainable as we're trying to add things more to the label right where is that happy balance to say i am fda compliant but i'm also a sustainable uh brand a sustainable company as well um we see a lot of packaging right now and a lot of labels um you know have this out Outer container, secondary packager, packaging, and then the inner container, uh, which is the uh, you know the tube or the bottle where the actual cosmetic bulk is held in, right? Um, so very important to understand the different types of um, cosmetic packaging that's out there, secondary, primary. Um, both the outer and inner containers must display readable information to be FDA compliant. So understanding what <laughs> readable means, uh, if any of you have touched upon the cosmetic labeling regulation, it can be overwhelming, can be confusing, um, especially when it comes to font sizes, container sizes, and even and small packaging, uh, you know, uh, regulations as well. So understanding um, what you have in terms of the outer and inner container is 
is very important. Um, labeling must include all written printed, uh, includes all the written printed and graphic material accompanying the product. Um, so this also includes anything that you have on an insert, um, you know, any additional uh, paper that you might have inside the packaging. So understanding all of these pieces kind of come together to make that final package, that final label that consumers will see when they purchase your product, right? So jumping right into that principal display panel, right? That principal display panel is the part of the label, the package that's most likely to be seen by a consumer, right? So it's very at the point of purchase, right? So it's very, very important to understand that what a consumer is seeing is important to be FDA compliant because that is the first time that they're seeing your package, right? And especially if you have a secondary um, outer carton to an inner, you know, tube, right? What is displayed on that principal display panel, right? So product name, product description, net quantity. This is all very much crucial to understand how the consumer is perceiving your product as they purchase it. Um, you know, we have so many conversations about, well, I'm creative and I, and I need to be creative and I want it to look a certain way. And you can be very creative, but you also need to be FDA compliant. So just understanding the information that has to be visible to a consumer as they purchase a product. Um, there are, you know, there are other regulations around the information panels that refer to the back and side panels, top, bottom panels as well, um, that also have to hear to these FDA regulations, um, but very important to understand that that principal display panel is, is really crucial into understanding what you need to have displayed when you're in market. Um, also want to touch base again on those mandatory um, statements and language, right? So statement of identity, the net quantity of contents, directions for safe use. Um, this is going to be huge uh, for anyone who has been a little vague or maybe not really explaining directions of use. Um, this will come into huge play uh, when you go to review your safety substantiation information that you will need now under MOCRA, right? So we've always, pu we're pushing our customers to understand what you have displayed as directions of use on your label can directly um, affect the safety testing that you do to prove that your product is safe when in use, right? So if you have an eye product, right, and it says directions use around the eye area, right? Make sure you're doing ocular testing, make sure you're doing sting testing, irritation testing. So make sure to recheck those directions of use. That That's my big call to uh, everyone to make sure that you have it properly stated. Um, also any necessary or mandatory warning statements. This will also come into crucial play um, as uh, we talk about uh, adverse event contact information on label a little bit later. Um, FDA has been taking, um, you know, warning um, statements very seriously because there is a lot that is missing from warning about certain products and their uses, right? Um, you know, there are the mandatory ones for self-pressurized uh, canisters, sunless tanning, right? Anything that would be um, needing a warning statement, but even further, right? Where have cosmetics have shifted, right? Where we're, we're making these claims about what they're able to do, what they're able to leave on, take off, frequency of use, um, types of skins that, uh, skin types that be, should be concerned, right? These are types of warnings that would be beneficial to have on your label to prevent uh, consumers to use your product that could have an adverse event from your product, right? We talk about people with acne prone skin, eczema, psoriasis, right? They are, are, are supposed to stay away from certain cosmetic products, right? Having those statements and those warnings are very beneficial to protect your brand um, from any type of misuse or any type of use that could potentially lead to an adverse event of a consumer using your product. Of course, corporate name and address of the manufacturer, packer, or distributor. Um, this is, you know, something that uh, we see on packs sometimes, sometimes not on packs. So, uh, very important to understand that the under MOCRA, the responsible person definition now refers to the manufacturer, packer, or distributor that is displayed on the label. When you are displayed on the label as the responsible person, you take on all the responsibilities that are deemed in MOCRA, right? So labeling, safety substantiation, product listings, adverse event, recalls, 
that all falls under you. So be very, very clear who is on the label, that corporate name, that address, because they will take on that responsibility. Um, you know, a lot of what we see out in market, we see manufactured by, packed by, right? And that could be very confusing. And, and moving forward with Mokra, um, that is not how things should be displayed anymore, right? The responsible person needs to be on that corporate uh, the corporate name and address on the label. And then of course, court, uh, country of origin. In terms of language, um, all labels um, by law have to be in the English language. If there is products that are distributed in Puerto Rico or other territories and where the predominant language is not English, you may state that required label information um, in place of English. If the label contains foreign language, right, we, we love to pack as much as we can to make sure we have one label across all our countries. Um, you know, it is important to understand that whatever's on that label or other label uh, uh, inserts or outer packaging must also be required in English as well. Um, you know, uh, a lot of what we see, uh, a lot of products sold in the U.S. are also sold in Canada, right? So understanding the French pieces, the English pieces, and even if you sell in other countries, um, making sure that English is predominant on the label as well. Getting into Mokra, um, you know, there are three significant changes that everyone needs to be aware of. And um, uh, one is already in effect. Uh, and I think that between the huge rush at the end of 2023 for registrations and product listings, a lot of the other regulations that went into effect December 29th, 2023 might have been overlooked. And one of them was professional labeling. Um, and I say this because we have moved into an a era of beauty where professional use products are being used by your regular consumers. Uh, we are able to to now go into professional beauty uh, stores more than ever. Uh, you know, we hear about uh, TikTokers and, and social media and Instagram influencers using professional products. Um, and it has caused, you know, a little bit of a stir, well, a lot of bit of a stir because professional products should be administered by licensed professionals. Um, these are in the fields of cosmetology and nail care, um, aesthetics, barbering, right? Even tattooing. Uh, these are the things that we need to think of that licensed professionals are taught to use these products correctly and we have consumers using them. Um, you know, I hear, uh, I'm from New Jersey and all we hear is the tattoo of makeup, right? And 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 people getting their eyebrows and lips tattooed um, in places where they probably probably should not be getting them tattooed, right? Um, same goes with any nail care as well. So um, professional use products now um, will have to comply with the labeling requirements under consumer products. And I think this is a great, great shift because now everybody is going to have the same type of labeling regulations. More importantly, though, there has to be a clear and prominent statement on these products that they need to be administered or used by licensed professionals. Um, and I think that is a huge takeaway when it comes to hair color, hair dyes. Uh, you know, the box that you buy in a CVS of hair dye is not the same hair dye you get when you go to a salon, right? And it needs to be understood that 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 difference is greatly affected to how a consumer will use that product, right? And the warnings that the, the consumer needs to have when they ha use that product. Um, lastly, drugs that are also professional use cosmetics must comply with professional use labeling requirements. So we live in this world where OTCs and cosmetics do mesh. Uh, we, you know, we do see a lot of these acne um, cosmetic products, these skincare products, that technically fall under this OTC monograph um, that uh, need to have those professional use labels as well. So when you think about when you go to the spa and there's these heavy, um, you know, creams and treatments that are being used that are technically, you know, drugs and technically cosmetics, but also for professional use because a professional needs to be using them. Those claims have to be um, put on there. Um, we have seen more than ever uh, brands launched in, in spas, right, in these treatments, also coming out with consumer-friendly 
um, types of products, right? So you have to differentiate between the one I'm allowed to take home, right, and use in my bathroom versus the one that the licensed professional is using on my face. And I think that is such a great takeaway to understand um, how the differences um, can be communicated to the consumers that are purchasing them and using them um, and using them correctly, right? And I think uh, this will shift a lot of the, the concerns that are in industry right now about these professional use products. The next uh, MOCRA labeling regulation is probably the most controversial. Uh, we have had most of our questions around adverse event contact information. Um, this, uh, this specific labeling regulation um, had a two-year delay. So it was one of the ones that um, they had called out that industry had two years to comply with this regulation because they knew how difficult it would be for companies to update their labels to add this information and to add it correctly so by december 29th of this year so a few weeks away uh, labels must include contact information for consumers to submit an adverse event that occurred when using a cosmetic product now, some of you are thinking, how has this not been a regulation? How has cosmetics just not had a process, right? So similar to drugs, dietary supplements, and, and medical devices, right? This is a requirement to have contact information for consumers um, that have adverse events, that have a channel to contact the brand that something had happened. Um, it has become, you know, cosmetics has been left behind. Although we see constantly in publications and social media in the lawsuits, how detrimental cosmetic products could be if potentially used wrong, overused or used in general, right? And there is no tracking, there is no visibility into that, you know, um, adverse event happening in the beauty industry. Uh, talc, I'm sure, is the most talked about situation, right? We're thinking talc products uh, in cosmetics. It's a great, cheap ingredient. Um, I spent most of my time in a lab uh, inhaling talc for my better 20s. So, uh, you know, uh, it's understanding that that type of exposure that was never seen to be a risk, never to seen to have any implication of an adverse event happening and and we're watching the lawsuits happen right where people have died people were in the hospital have long-term illnesses from using talc products um and more recently i'm sure everyone has seen you know the dry shampoos everything that's coming out um we need to be aware of right as a community of of cosmetic uh, regulatory professionals as a community of beauty, um, we have to make sure what we're putting out there is having the right information, right? And if something does go wrong, that you're able to contact the brand. Um, one thing to know is this is required on both the primary, so the product and secondary packaging labels. Um, if you have a carton and, uh, and a tube and the consumer buys it, throws the carton out, that tube has to have that information on it. Uh, no one wants anyone digging through the garbage to try to find that carton. And, and if there is a case where there's a delayed reaction, right, the consumer still has to have that piece of information to contact. Um, for the actual on label, FDA has provided a different ways that it can be displayed. So it can be the physical address, so a domestic US street address, a domestic US phone number. And we are so lucky that FDA allowed cosmetics to have electronic address. No other industry in FDA has been allowed to have an electronic address for adverse event. Uh, contact information. And I will say, take full advantage of this because adverse events are going to fly in. And I say that because I, I'm from cosmetics, I've been in cosmetics, and it's very personal and sensitive and anything happening on the face or the hair is 100% going to be considered an adverse event. So um, I definitely uh, uh, push for everyone to take advantage of this electronic address um, and, and be grateful that we were able to have that as a cosmetic community um, allowed by FDA. And I say that because physical address, I'm not sure who's typing or writing letters and mailing them anymore. And by the time you get them, it's very hard to handle an adverse event the right way. And phone numbers are great, but they're still messaging services. You're not getting all the information you need. Um, it's very hard to call these people back if that is the only point of contact as well. Um, 
love to talk about adverse events. I'll, I could talk about it all day, but in the interest of time, anyone who needs more information, uh, please reach out. Um, last, fragrance allergens. Um, you know, this has been the talk of, I think, every country that has to do with cosmetics. And I think that as we see other countries expand and grow, um, we will see other, uh, uh, other developments from FDA. So currently FDA does list the 26 fragrance allergens from the EU annex on their website. So if you were to go to FDA website, look under allergens, fragrance allergens, this is the list you would see. Um, uh, fragrance allergens will need to be listed on the cosmetic product ingredient listing. The rule was due in, the proposed rule was due in June, uh, but FDA has pushed that back to October. So the month we're sitting in right now, any day now, we can hear a proposed rule uh, of the fragrance allergens that FDA plans to implement. Um, there will be a 180 day, uh, or there will be a public comment session. We're not sure how long that will be open for, but then the final rule will be issued 180 days after that. Um, for many of you that are in the EU or UK or in Health Canada, you already know this 26 fragrance allergen list is no longer the list, right? We've expanded to a larger list, 56 additional allergens. We've heard of every fragrance house testing left and right to make sure they understand thresholds, they understand the scientific background and, and understand what the consumer is going to see and perceive when it's on the label and for brands to be prepared to put this on label in other countries. Um, FDA, we're not sure where they're leaning. They can go you know, full force and follow EU, follow Canada, or they can stick to this 26 list um, that California has adopted, but California has now also moved to the EU list as well. So it will be very interesting to see in the next uh, few days uh, what FDA will come out with. For the responsible person, just to know, um, when you have fragrance or flavor or an ingredient that has a fragrance allergen, so don't forget about your essential oils or any of your extracts that naturally can have a fragrance allergen. I always say this with the lilac oils, the lemon oils, citrus oils, you will definitely have some type of fragrance allergen. Um, just because you don't have a fragrance does not mean that allergen doesn't exist in your product, right? So make sure to do your due diligence. Don't just write this off and say, I don't have a fragrance. I don't have a flavor. It could be somewhere else, right? So um, FDA is now going to be able to access information about your fragrance ingredients. Um, if they believe that that ingredient has caused an advert, a serious adverse event, right? So just know what you're putting on your label. You better make sure that it's correct or that you have it listed on the label if it's not technically, if it is technically in your formulation. Um, and then FDA is also going to be able to request a list of ingredients or categories of ingredients specific to that fragrance or flavor. Flavor. Um, this is not going away. EU has made a huge stance about fragrance allergens and the, the reaction that people have when uh, having a large dose of fragrance allergens exposed to their skin. Um, so just be mindful. Again, not fragrance and flavor allergens just exist there. They exist in multiple places. Um, we're going to get into the FDA authority, um, but understanding what a misbranded cosmetic product is, is very important to understand when it comes to labeling. Um, so if the labeling is false or misleading, if it lacks required information, if it's conspicuous or unreadable of required um, information, if there's misleading packaging, improper packaging and labeling of color additives, um, if there's deficiencies where Poison Prevention Packaging Act um, required in special packaging, um, and then again, MOCRA now is under this misbranded cosmetic definition as well. So if you're missing any of the professional use labeling, adverse event contact information, or fragrance allergen disclosures, you can be deemed a misbranded cosmetic. Um, I am going to show you the big picture of FDA's authority. <laughs> Understand that where the misbranded piece comes in for labeling specifically, right? FDA can issue a mandatory recall if your label or your product is misbranded, right? So understanding how that violates um, this new MOCA regulation and existing packaging and labeling 
regulations, right? And that recall piece is going to be huge. Uh, I can't tell you how many times that I, I see package that's not correct. When I'm like normally shopping out in a retailer and I see packaging and I'm like, oh, this definitely is missing this information, right? We want to be checking our labels. We want to go back to this because labels will be under the highest scrutiny coming in December, right? This is where we're going to see the hugest shift of FDA calling out brands, calling out companies for not have or pr having proper labeling. Another very important piece to mention here is when you have a serious adverse event with your product, you need to submit a copy of your label. So the last thing you wanna have is a serious adverse event happen and then have to hand over a non-compliant label to FTA. Um, I don't know how it gets worse than that, but I, I'm gonna assume that there might be other situations worse, but you wanna be prepared now. So do your label reviews, understand what could be potentially wrong. Um, same goes into any warning letters, import detentions. We see more detentions at customs for labels than anything else, right? Misleading packaging, um, claiming drug, um, you know, capabilities on a cosmetic, color additives not being correct, missing net quantities. These things you need to be aware of and understand. Uh, the other pieces of their authority around suspending facilities and inspection of facilities, also very crucial for you guys to know, um, but not not directly involved with the labeling. Um, same with import alerts understanding that this is a, a full scope of FDA authority. I never want to just give a, a piece of what could go wrong. I want everyone to understand there's a huge picture of what FDA's authority now has moved into. And more specifically, what your label will come into uh, if it is not compliant with existing and now new MOCRA regulations. So, um, and that it kind of concludes our MOCRA piece of it. Um, we definitely um, have, uh, I'm sure, some questions. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, again, there's uh, there's quite a lot of uh, questions, but uh, unfortunately, we also ran uh, slightly uh, out of time. We are already beyond our allotted uh, time frame. So. Um, uh, I, I would like to um, uh, definitely apologize uh, for, for that also to, to our audience. And hopefully you guys have uh, like uh, maybe five minutes uh, more for us. I have maybe really uh, quickly, Jacqueline, this is one uh, question uh, in particular that I would like to um, ask you is, is um, the, the context of e-commerce and the MOCRA uh, regulation. Is there anything specific to e-commerce that we need to uh, consider in, in the context of MOCRA? If you're selling so products via online... Yeah, so, um, you know, what MOCRA doesn't call out specifically e-commerce. Um, what they do call out, though, is that if you are, say, a foreign company or a foreign, uh, you know, a uh, brand that's selling into the U.S. and shipping to the U.S., uh, you need to be compliant with the FDA uh, uh, labeling requirements just as anybody else is. Um, and I think that's a huge takeaway. Um, there has been a ton of warning letters went out to Amazon, went out to Walmart. Um, the FDA is looking at these online e-commerce um, companies very much closely because they feel like that's some type of roundabout of like how to not be compliant compliant, uh, but FDA is heavily focused on making sure if you are shipping to the U.S. and you know when you go on Amazon, you can see ships to U.S., um, that FDA is watching them closely to see if they are going to be compliant. Um, and all these warning letters are visible on FDA's websites, um, but it is under the assumption if you sell online and you ship to the U.S., you need to be compliant with all these regulations as well. Okay, that's uh, that's totally clear. Well, um, in the interest of time, uh, Jacqueline, we're, I'm going to uh, close it off here. Uh, thanks for uh, scaring the living daylights out of all of us with the MoPro update. Oh, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> it was a very useful um, uh, update. You brought us back uh, up to speed in terms of this uh, this regulation. So thank you wholeheartedly, uh, Jacqueline. Um, Let's move um, forward and, and hopefully um, people in the audience, you will forgive us for uh, an, another five minutes uh, more, but I would like to uh, give uh, my colleague uh, Tony the, uh, the opportunity to um, talk us a little bit through what uh, ESCO has to offer in terms of solutions uh, to handle some of the challenges that we've heard uh, before. Tony, it's over to you. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm very, very conscious of the time we've run over, so I'm gonna try and be respectful and move through 
quickly, but in a detailed way. Um, so let's just move on um, really quickly. And I just want to just take a second to revisit this slide. Um, I just want to pause and take stock of the things that we've discussed today and more specifically how brands manage and execute on these expectations because there are so many spinning plates that brands need to maintain to continue existing in the industry with all the expectations around compliance, all whilst in an effort to thrive in the market they're serving in terms of you know, the complexity and the increase, that, that's all just increasing and compounding. Um, the demands from a regulatory perspective are driving pressure like never seen before on the expectations around that compliance whilst at the same time the market is driving that pressure in variety thinking about that innovation relevance choice and and the business is also driving that pressure um, to do all of those things in a faster and more importantly commercially viable way so today brands are approaching this in a way to really hone in in the technologies that can assist with this ensuring speed agility account um, accuracy and quality and they're looking to find innovative digital transformation journeys that can do that heavy lifting for them. OK, so taking all of these um, multiple things they need to juggle and how do you execute it in a really effective way? And they're looking to technology to try and achieve that. And ESCO de developed this packaging centric digital maturity model that really helps frame that. And, and Jan, back to when you were saying, you know, it really helps brands really think about a where they are, but more importantly, what are the steps to get them where they want to be? So assessing what utopia looks like and thinking about how to get there. And we're going to dive into that. And I'm going to try again to keep brevity in mind. Um, I'm going to move past this poll just for the sake of uh, time. There is a survey that is hopefully everyone can see that um, on the tool, a survey where you'll be able to communicate with us further on these items. But normally I would, I would ask you to take stock um, on the digital maturity model and tell us where you think you are. And it's normally interesting. There is a variety um, of brands that sit across the entire spectrum of this digital maturity model. And that's something that we talk about daily with our clients. If I wanted to look at it um, a little bit further, I, we can talk about this um, after the webinar. If you ever find that you wanted to kind of discuss in more detail this, please do reach out. Um, so that for that purpose, we're going to move past that poll. Oops, sorry. OK. So. ESCO has an extensive suite. We looked at how we connect the digital maturity model to the suite of solutions that we have. And we have an extensive suite of solutions with a sole purpose is to unplug the bottlenecks that the packaging and artwork process can be prone to. All right, and through this partnership with the world's largest brands, we've driven these innovative solutions, focusing really on a true end-to-end -end ecosystem that really does problem solve. And we're deeply cognizant of the need to establish those solid foundations around the people, around the processes and the, and the technology that underpins that. And we enable brands to respond, create and deliver projects swiftly. And at the center of this, this the engine room of this is our solution, which is Web Center. And ESCO solutions are orientated around our Web Center platform, which can then be built upon. It can be grown, it can be evolved depending on the brand's most pressing uh, challenges. So I'm going to cough two seconds. This is a really good, um, powerful, um, it's a really good, powerful collaborative workflow platform that behaves like your process butler. OK, it's being configured and it's going to meet even the most demanding of processes needed to bring your products to market. And this is about bringing the right tasks to the right people at the right time all whilst leveraging that core and fundamental thread, which is so important as that single source of truth. All right. And that's going to be whether it's via integrations in the wider systems, pushing or pulling data into projects. It's going to be a complete and intelligent library of usable assets. It's the collation and application of approved content. It's the organized and reusable templated libraries, structural and artwork. This is the true end to end in terms of your packaging process. 
It's the integrating of the specific and required technical tools to execute on those tasks quickly. It's in plat platform project communication. All right, so think about the collaboration of the approvals and the communication, all whilst being complete, trackable, actionable. But why is this important? It's about the benefits you receive from achieving all of that. And what does this solution actually deliver on or the, our solutions deliver upon? And giving credit to all of those spinning plates that we've talked about earlier, using digital tools to assist your people and underpin your processes, brands with ESCO are able to get the products to market faster. They're able to be more responsive and agile to meet those re regulatory requirements. They do so in a quality way by mitigating all of those risks and all whilst reducing the costs of, um, associated with achieving the operational efficiency. So that could be doing more with less or doing even more with the same. Hopefully, I've met my brief of being very quick and hopefully slightly more informative in terms of how we work with brands to deliver all of those, not conflicting, but multiple expectations in terms of the market that you that you serve, the industry that you exist in, and the clients that you need to deliver with. So at this point, you know, we would love the opportunity if any of the brands want to discover how we help brands get to market faster in a safe, equitable, uh, compliant way, please do feel free to reach out to us and the contact details. Oh, okay. And the, the contact details will be on the system. So I really look forward to hearing from anyone in the near future. Thank you for your time. And thank you, uh, Tony, for uh, sharing and shedding some light on ESCO solutions, more specifically on the benefits that such solutions bring to uh, allow uh, uh, people to balance uh, risk, uh, costs, and uh, efficiency and speed to market. So uh, yeah, thank you for, uh, for your contribution here. This, uh, this brings us to the end of the, um, of the webinar. Uh, again, our sincere apologies for running slightly over time, but um, I hope it was um, worth your while to, uh, to stay on. And again, um, echoing what Tony said earlier, if you want to learn more about this, uh, absolutely feel free to reach out.